Hello, welcome to the roundtable discussion with particip participants from three of the projects in our Start Methodologies exhibition at the University of Wolverhampton. My name is Richard Glover. I'm a reader in music here at the university, working in composition and how different processes can be experienced through performing music. I'm co-hosting this roundtable with Martin Kachira. Martin? Hello, yes, I'm Martin Kachira and um, I'm an Associate Professor for Engagement in STEM and I'll be your other host for this, uh, this Artists and Scientists Roundtable today, um, along with Richard. And um, I think we're going to have some fantastic discussions around the, the collaborations that we've seen as part of our projects between scientists, technologists and artists that have been part of the projects we've had today. Thanks, Martin. So to give you an idea of the structure of this roundtable, we'll be hearing presentations on each of the three projects first, followed by individual discussions on each project before opening up for wider discussion. So we'll begin with a presentation by Julia, Julia Tomasello on the ALMA project, which is a follow on project from Future Flora. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Giulia Tomasello, I'm an interaction designer. I'm Italian, but uh, recently based between um, Berlin and Italy. And uh, in the talk, there is also Tommaso Busolo, uh, the materials scientist and tech part of the, um, of the project that we are gonna introduce you now. And the project is called ALMA. So, um, when I started to, to work in, in, the, in, in this field as an interaction designer, I, I always like thought that uh, like, there is a, a, the best introduction for me is really with a sentence from Simone de Beauvoir, which, which says, that's me, I have a body, I'm a woman, and my body is a social construction rather than a naturally given datum. And uh, with this uh, sentence, Simone de Beauvoir really wanted to say, and, like how actually in the society female are perceived. So they are perceived as the female that actually they give birth, so the natural body, but also the female that are, um, they have a constructed body. So what actually the society is expecting for female. And this is something that as a designer really kind of struggled me to, to, cre to, to understand why somehow we are so surrounded by taboo. And uh, so in my work, I really base like uh, the use of technology and biotechnology for the female intimate care. And as you can see, like uh, um, I'm taking inspiration from the women in Boston in 1970, where they were meeting every um, like week to really talk about uh, topics that they were been always considered taboo. So topics like menstruation, giving birth, uh, uh, birth control, or even uh, um, sexual health that most of the time where I've been spoken like with the male doctors, and we can argue that even now those topics are considered taboo. And they were meeting really, really between female to try to understand how to destigmatize the taboo, this taboo. And they made a book called Our Bodies, Ourselves that spread all over to really try to give education to female. So my approach as a designer started with actually growing bacteria. So I was um, studying in Santa San Martin's Material Futures, and I started to grow um, textile on bacteria. And especially like um, I was like growing uh, from like uh, my body. So like from like my uh, vulva skin, my nose, like different parts that most of the time like are considered quite taboo and see what it was growing. And then I was combining it with textile to see actually how the combination could really merge together. And then I, I started to think about, so actually, what if uh, we would wear bacteria to empower female? So what actually if we see what is behind already products existing in the market and we can try to understand that actually maybe they are made as well of bacteria as we are as well as human. So, the project near, like Future Flora, which is actually also an exhibition um, with SARS and methodology and was also a case from uh, uh, Denise Dual, is actually like a kit designed for women to treat and prevent candida infection. And it's a kit where the woman has at home like a little pad made of agar-agar where she can swab healthy bacteria on top and try to grow 
healthy bacteria to balance their flora. And Girl Biophilia is actually a documentary that we produced uh, in 2017, and it really kind of uh, speaks loud on how FEMA could, could try to actually embrace biotechnology at home. And uh, I talk about this innovation as about time because at the beginning has been perceived very provocative, this project, but actually in 2018, it received the Starts Prize from Arts Electronica as an honor and in innovation uh, in science society for the arts. And so it completely changed like the vision, which actually is not anymore something that we've perceived far, but why not that one day we will have an incubator at home, we know how to grow bacteria, and we as female, we can take a, care of our own body. So then from Future Flora, we moved on to ALMA. And ALMA is a wearable biosensor for monitoring vaginal fluids. And at the moment, actually until two days ago, it has been funded from Refream, which is another uh, Horizon 2020 European funded that really gave us the opportunity to push forward, forward this project. And we had a technical support, uh, which was Fraunhofer uh, in IZM in Berlin. So Thomas, maybe now you can introduce better the product. So uh, hi everyone, uh, as Julia said, I'm Tommaso, I'm the material scientist. And here I'm gonna tell you a bit more about on the ALMA project in particular, why we build, where we're building this and what have we built so far. So first we kind of want to focus on vaginal infections because 75% of women suffer of one of these infections in their lifetime and 8% of women suffer, suffer from recurrent forms of infections. So this is something that is clearly a problem but is not really much talked about because of the taboo and the stigma around this. So we decided to combine Judith's expertise in design and my uh, technical background to produce a pH sensor to measure the uh, pH in vaginal fluids. This is a, a, was done in collaboration with Fraunhofer and here you can see uh, us working in the lab or working remotely where I was, uh, I'm based in Cambridge, I'm a PhD student there and uh, I was kind of like helping out uh, all the chemistry work. Um, this has been a very uh, successful project because we built a underwear that has an embedded pH sensor that is able to uh, record data and wirelessly transmit it to the user's phone so that female can be informed about um, their vaginal health on a, uh, continuous, uh, on a continuous method. And uh, yeah, Julia, back to you. So, and actually the, the picture you saw before is actually the last prototypes that we have been producing and that we will show more during the Ars Electronica Festival because we will have actually our final presentation of Reframe. And this is just a, li a little like a peek of how it was our approach. So it was really dictated by a user experience approach and a co-design and participatory design. And we really like dive through like what is actually mean to talk about intimate healthcare. So we have been running so far from the beginning of Reframe in October, uh, different workshops uh, from also different parts of the world because of uh, the nature of my work that I was quite nomad. So we started with a workshop in uh, Rio de Janeiro, then in Milan, Bangkok, Malaysia, in Penang, and then Basel to really try also to understand how female from different cultures and different also ages, but different backgrounds can really talk about intimate care and if we do. And as you can expect, like the majority, actually, we don't talk because it's still really a taboo. But actually, when you put female together, it's when the more the, the sparkling starts, because actually we want to talk about and we want to have an understanding of what is happening. So Alma Miss Flora is actually the title of this workshop that also is a survey that you can find online. And it's called Alma Miss Flora because it looks like kind of two girls meeting up, but actually it's Alma the sensor meeting the vaginal flora. Uh, we are still running workshops and surveys. So please, if you're interested to actually like help us to design this future of this uh, underwear, uh, support us and go on my website and, uh, and actually apply for the, for the survey. And this is who we are, like it's a, a very big team so far. And uh, we really like remotely, we managed to, to work and it's the best part. And yeah, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you for that presentation. Okay, I think we're now moving on to the uh, Be Another Lab presentation for Library of Ourselves. Christian and uh, Norma, welcome, um, welcome to our uh, our round table. So, if you'd like to uh, like to give your presentation, uh... um, Christian. We can't hear Christians. Yeah, and Christian, maybe maybe you're on mute still. No, he has unmuted him. Hmm. Because we did hear Christian when he logged on initially. We did. Yeah. Yeah, we have um, we have divided our our presentation, so so he. He'll actually do it rather than me. So okay. I'm not sure. Christian, if you click on the sound icon in the bottom right hand corner. It's just uh Christian just says it's gonna rejoin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, typical uh typical uh um technology problems first thing in the morning. At least we can edit this out. That's fine. It's like uh, you, you know, we 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 it can gone. <laughs> Problems all gone. <laughs> uh, no. Okay. Do you want me to talk a bit about uh, the collective itself? before Christian starts um, talking about more the project of Library of Ourselves. Okay, yeah, I think that, yeah, I think that, that could be good. That could, uh, here's Christian. Oh, okay. Hello, testing, one, two. Hello, uh, testing, okay. testing. Oh, great. Receive it loud and clear, loud and clear. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> My microphone just deactivated and now it's active again. Um, okay. I can't hear Christian's so, sound. Thank you very much for having us to our work. Um, we are at Collective Hello? Hello? Your, 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 your sound. Oh, uh, man. Yeah, uh, that's better. Okay. Maybe. Is there a delay? In what I'm saying? Or. There is, the, the, the sound quality is, is poor uh, and, uh, and, and there is a delay. The okay. Oh, we've lost you, Chris. No. No. Yeah. Not sure. So I'll just continue. It looks like it's coming through. Would it help if, if you turn video on? Um, so yeah. I really don't know why this is. If you just give yeah, me a moment, this is great for a second. Yeah, video off, I think will probably help. Everything is coming, everybody's coming through fine. Is this helpful? That's Testing one, better. two, is, uh, or am I coming through? Or still continue, it looks like it's coming through clear now. Again, I have a different computer. If you just give me, is this helpful? Well, um, I'll just uh, keep my video. If, uh, if, it, if you want me to, I can restart this on a different computer and see if that works better, but uh, I'll just continue that's for now. Much better now. Okay. Christian, that, that's, that's much better with, that, with, the, with the video off. Okay, sorry for the frustration. Um, uh, I'll try to fix it for the, for the discussion part. I'll get another computer running here while the next presentation is happening. 
So, uh, hello, uh, my name is Christian. Um, uh, so thank you very much for having us uh, on the panel here. I'm looking forward to exchanging perspectives with, um, with everybody. So beforehand, I'll just give a little brief introduction to some of the work we've been doing, um, particularly around uh, this a broader project called Library of Ourselves. So we've been active uh, since uh, 2012. There's um, about eight different members of the team spread about in different countries. We come from very uh, different disciplinary contexts from uh, uh, computer science, from conflict resolution, from social anthropology, um, cognitive science. And really what we've been working on is on the notion of embodiment um, and trying to create uh, interfaces and protocols for um, uh, altering your sense of self, your sense of embodiment and what your body is and looking into the possibilities of um, sharing experiences with others and inhabiting other other sorts of uh, realities and perspectives. So there's a physical component of this, which is, as you can see here, there's two users exchanging perspectives um, uh, with the real-time uh, uh, feedback, let's say tactile feedback, um, to kind of hack that uh, bodily perception. On top of the this uh, bottom-up layer, let's say, we also have, uh, I guess, a top-down layer that uh, aids in this uh, body transfer illusion of uh, narrative as well. So it's not just about inhabiting a body, but about how that body, who that uh, is situated in a particular context and, um, and what their story might be. So our way of uh, generating uh, or approaching this, uh, this project has been very collaborative in nature. Um, usually in each context that we work in, we start from uh, the ground up in terms of uh, clearly kind of isolating and, and talking through what the goals are of the project, what the expectations are, what the risks are, and trying to use the um, methodologies um, more of like from an artistic background, let's say, that allow for a different hierarchical nature, a uh, different power structure in the in the generation of the of the projects that we do. So these are, while the projects might be similar, let's say from one context to the next, um, they are very much um, determined by the local context, by our uh, collaborators from different communities, from different institutional partners, about what the needs and uh, particularities are of engaging in that context. So it's really a hyper-local formulation of the project in each context that it goes. So while we did a lot of stuff which was very much real time and performative, we also were working with uh, immersive video and using some of the same uh, immersive theater protocols to create this physical illusion of being in the body of another person. And with that, then we used, um, or we approached it as a, as a way of telling different stories also. Um, so as you can see, if you just go back a couple of slides um, uh, to the blue slide, one more, a uh, couple more behind, if you don't, if, you, if that's okay, Denise. There you go. So um, here you'll see that there's a user and there's a facilitator facilitating the experience. If you see just on the screen there, it's quite small on the bottom. It's the next slide as well. What they're seeing is, uh, is this. So this is um, a video that we filmed with Joe, uh, who's a trans man um, and talks about their transition, their um, uh, no, their embodied identity, reflecting that, how they feel in public space, in the home, relations, and so forth. Um, and it's a way of stepping in to um, what this, um, uh, what their experience might be. So um, with each particular project, there's been different goals um, about what, the, what they've been targeted for. If you go to the next one, um, this was a collaboration that we did with uh, Muslim teenagers in Barcelona, looking at uh, trying to reflect the, their lived experience. And in this case, it was more theatrical reconstructions of things that had happened to them in public spaces, in schools, in job interviews of, um, of discrimination that they had faced. And what their idea was, was to create, use this material to create some public interventions around it as well. So we took the setup to the street. Um, did different, uh, gathered people, you know, oh, come try VR, not telling them what it was about, having them step into these experiences. And then afterwards, um, the people who had created the experiences would, uh, would appear and, and have a chat with them and say, well, have you ever experienced this? Have you seen this happen? Do you know how to behave when this happens? And really using it as a, as an, as a, as a possible intervention um, to generate these kinds of conversations. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, that's also from that same project. There's another slide there. Uh, if you go to the next one as well, uh, this was in Argentina working with um, um, uh, people from the refugee community there. 
Um, you can go to the next slide also. Um, this is, uh, again, more of a, one of these reconstructed ones. We were working in a, um, a an event that was, uh, I suppose, like a hackathon um, around um, the peace, peace Initiative in Colombia. And uh, so what we created here was uh, a collection of different people's experiences that they sort of constructed into a common narrative around the notion of um, violence, forgiveness, um, and in this case, you take the, the point of view of the aggressor, starting from their childhood up until um, uh, a scene of a kidnapping, and then you meet the person that you've kidnapped uh, later. It's the sister of your partner at the time. It's Anyway, it's, there's, a, there's a narrative to these things, and it's all really about um, forgiveness. So in each of these cases, none of these things would have been um, uh, narratives that we would have been able to come up with on our own if we tried to go in there and impose a particular view of what should have happened, but rather they emerged from an art, uh, this collaborative, uh, uh, quite horizontal process of uh, narrative construction and utilizing the technology um, for this. Now, each of these uh, different uh, uh, projects also offer up opportunities for, um, let's say, analysis or research around these issues, around people's public perceptions of them, around the effectiveness of these interventions for generating different empathic or responses. Um, or perspective taking. And so we've been involved a lot uh, in a lot of that as well. So different members of the team have been um, actively embedded in research institutions, um, doing more formalized uh, work um, and, a pro and uh, reformulating some of the, um, these more public experiments, more social experiments into um, uh, lab contexts as well. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, there's just the scene from the, the kidnapping thing here. And it's interesting to think about the notion of um, agency, I think. Like in this case, the the user is the, the interaction design, let's say, is uh, to, to talk about that a little bit. The user, in order to be able to have the physical um, experience of being in the body of the other person, can only uh, imitate the movements that they're seeing in the video, which is different than the real-time setup that we have of swapping bodies. So the notion of agency is that they have less agency. So in this case, um, having to put the tape over the person's mouth, um, most of the users that we've talked to afterwards said, I really did not, like, I did, I did not want to do that at all. Like, this is the last thing I wanted to do. It was really quite a jarring emotional experience. But feeling like the desire to not want to do something and still having to do it allowed them to empathize with the person's perspective of also being in that situation, maybe participating in an act of aggression, not wanting to do it, but feeling compelled to, feeling pressure that uh, that there was really no escape and having to participate in that. So it's very interesting how the notion of agency also translates into um, uh, like an affordance, let's say, of a particular interactive system can allow for different kinds of perspectives into individual experiences, um, which have nothing to do with technology. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, this is, again, another project that we did in a community, a gypsy community in Portugal, looking at lived experiences there. So each of these places are places where we've been invited uh, to go. Um, we don't necessarily seek them out. Um, there's usually an embedded person within an institution, within a community that is interested in collaborating with us. And that's what uh, helps us uh, facilitate um, <clears throat> this work. Um, I think um, I think I might stop there and see if Norma wants to add anything. Um, uh, I'm much more interested in getting to the the meat of the discussion here, but uh, I think that might be enough to to start with. Uh, Norma, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, maybe just briefly. Um, I guess I'm I'm a hybrid myself in this collective. Uh, so Bina the Lab really started in 2013, and um, everybody has an interdisciplinary background, but I. Um, first started collaborating with the team as an anthropologist. So I was doing my PhD research with them. And in, the, in this process, I became a member of the lab as well. So um, and now I'm kind of having to think what, what, are, what is the epistemology of my own knowledge production, being a member of the team, uh, at the same time, um, learn how do I, how, what kind of research do I do with the collective? And, um, I think yeah, it's posing some interesting questions of how uh, collaborative knowledge production can can work, and also how it works uh, in the kind of under the umbrella of art, and then um, being based at the university, so having a way more formal context, um, and then which kind of constraints 
I have in my in my participation participation here. But yeah, I would also like to um, discuss that in more detail later, maybe. Okay, thank you so much, Christian and Norma. Much appreciated. So we'll turn finally to uh, the project Virophilia, which is led by Pei Ying Lin with Miranda de Graaf as well. Yes, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Pei Ying Lin. I'm from Taiwan, but currently resides in the Netherlands and with uh, my collaborator Miranda de Graaf. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll start with the concept. Uh, so I have a series of projects that's surrounding the topic of viruses. Uh, it was during my collaboration with Miranda that she introduced me this idea of virus fear. So the virus fear is all those places where viruses are found or which they interact with their hosts. Um, we are probably already very familiar with the idea of biosphere, uh, where it consists of all the living beings. Um, but then viruses are a little bit odd, like they're considered in biology that they're not alive, but at the same time, they are alive and replicating on other living beings. And that creates a very interesting um, area, which, um, yes, please, next slide, uh, which it was uh, the starting point of my collaboration with Miranda. Uh, which is the project Tames to Tame. And I was suggesting that we perhaps can tame the viruses. But before uh, I start with the project itself, I'll leave it to Miranda to talk about the virus we were dealing with. Yeah, so to first introduce the virus that we work with, which is uh, norovirus. So norovirus has a huge diversity. Um, so on the right, you see a phylogenetic tree representing uh, the diversity of viruses that we have for norovirus. And what you can see is that not only is there a lot of diversity, it also affects a lot of different uh, human and animal species. Uh, and actually each uh, species has its own type of norovirus. So in humans, 80% of all infections is only caused by one type. Um, but what we see during time is um, that we see novel uh, variants emerging. Uh, and the process behind this really um, is part of my uh, uh, research questions that I have. So next slide, please. So uh, my work group mainly works on, on these questions. So where do these new viruses come from? Uh, and uh, where, they, yeah, where they do, do they originate? Uh, and what are the mechanisms behind this process? So we have some theories that either they emerge in uh, humans that we don't uh, test for norovirus, or perhaps they emerge in immunocompromised patients because they can be infected with norovirus for uh, many months. Or it can also happen that these viruses emerge in the animal population and then uh, go to humans. Next slide. <laughs> yes. So um, Miranda mentioned this really interesting thing that I never thought of is that there's no vaccine available for norovirus so far. And then I think all of the people have been infected by norovirus probably at least once in your lifetime because it caused you puke and diarrhea. And you feel like you are almost dying when you're puking. Well, so it becomes interesting if we don't have the vaccine for it, that means we cannot protect ourselves from it. So we are always vulnerable towards them. Then is it possible that we can live with them? And so we start with this concept of having virus tamers. These tamers are trying to live with the viruses. And so the next slide, which we can see in the manifesto, we ask the tamers to think about uh, five important questions to define ourselves. So we need to think of whether humans are a part of nature or not. And we need to think about viruses. Are they just like another wild animals or are they our enemies? And also we need to think about individual human or do we think about the others like our species more when we make decisions? And also um, the final one is do we think ourselves as the habitant of the viruses or they are living on us and they are our parasite? And by changing all this concept, could we possibly become more friendly towards them and live with them? So what you see in the picture right now is a plushie doll 
that you can actually try to hug it. It's on the shape of a norovirus. Um, it's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but the geometric uh, shape is the same. And then the next slide. Uh, we also um, have this question of if we have different affinity with the viruses, uh, like what Miranda was talking about earlier, there are different strain of the norovirus. And if I got infected with a certain strain, then I will have immunity towards it. And that's the only way we can. Then does that immunity uh, define ourselves and also change our behavior? So the next slide, uh, you can see this is the array that we did our blood test on and to see my, um, my reaction, my antibody reactions towards the norovirus and Miranda's. And Miranda will talk about the detail, how it works. So in the next slide. So what we see here on top is the genetic material of norovirus. Um, and the genetic material encodes several proteins. And what we do is we express those proteins and we don't do it for one type of norovirus, but we do it for all the types of norovirus. Um, and we print these on uh, small glass slides and these glass slides we can incubate with serum, just like me and Pei did. Um, and by doing this, you can see uh, which viruses are recognized. So you can see which viruses you were probably infected by. Yeah, so um, we create a profile of ourselves and so we can see that what kind of immunity we have towards it. And then it turns out that I have uh, reacted and encountered a bit more viruses before. So this profile actually suggests us to behave differently as a tamer. So um, the next slide. Uh, the squirrels are the two years history of our routes of traveling like where we've been in, on earth and also the time of our sickness so we will know that we actually came across the path of the virus at a certain time and that makes me become the virus tamers who want to encounter more viruses all the time to get immunity so as long as i get the immunity that i can deliver the resources or take care of people when they get sick and uh, where miranda she's in the lab all the time with norovirus and she has to protect her, herself. So she has to regulate her movements all the time to make sure that she's not encountering the viruses. So the next slide. Um, for some tamers, if they want to go my route and to get sick all the time, then you have to be mentally prepared. So this is a tea that makes the tamers to drink so you can have puke and diarrhea. And once you get used to that physical experience, then you don't get panic when you get sick. And the next one, uh, there is also this uh, movement exercise that the tamers can do. So you get a better control of your body and also you get more used to cough on your arms if it's required because that physicality is not that common uh, before COVID-19, more, probably more common now. And you always hold your hands so you don't touch whatever and uh, these kind of exercises. And the next one, um, we also do the exploration of a dance to see what our movement will change once we take this concept of taming the virus, encountering the virus all the time, um, will us move differently in the space. And the next one, and there's also this board game where you can impersonate uh, with real biological data to play different characters with different uh, immunity and different age. So you can collaborate with each other, trying to make sure that the viruses don't die out completely, but at the same time, don't harm the vulnerable people. And this one leads to the next project, which is virophilia. Uh, it's the one that is showing this time. So virophilia, comes after the question, after this tea for puke and diarrhea, that I was questioning how close can we get with the viruses? And also, can these physical reactions create something beneficial for us? Um, so the next one. Uh, the virophilia sometimes exists as a performance and sometimes as an installation. And what you see here is a 
grow. It has all the names of viruses that we know so far, but it's only the master list. So there are still some other names in there. Like for example, the one called COVID-19 is not on there. Um, it's increasing massively every year. And then the cookbook. Uh, so the cookbook is written uh, in the year of 2068. I wrote it like two years ago, but the concepts that is written in the future, but looking back at now and see how we can develop our history as a collaboration with the viruses later on, which you can see in the chapters, I like start with simulating the viral experiences by simulating how they make us sick. And then starting with um, using viruses like bacteria for fermentation to change the texture and uh, taste of plants or other food material which was once living. And then the third chapter is using viruses as active ingredients, like something makes your throat hurt as a part of the dining experience. And then chapter four, dynamic cozing, which is using the viruses to control the change of taste and change of a whole microbe system when you are fermenting. And the last chapter is cuisines that design for everybody that's in a food chain. So it's a dinner, but it's the dinner that's for everybody on in uh, involved. And the next page. So this is a simulation of um, influenza. And the next page. Uh, this is another simulation for norovirus, which if you eat the oyster, it will make you puke uh, diarrhea. Yeah. And the next one, uh, this is the snapshot of the viral fermentation. And next one, this is an uh, influence that egg on rice, which when you eat the raw egg, it creates a slight um, sensation of sickness with your throat and slightly higher temperature. And the next one. So it also exists in a video format where you will see um, a person eating the virus's dish and then there was a text uh, indicating how virus is interacting with her body at that moment. And then the next. So during the dinner um, performance, uh, people are served with these foods. I know I will guide them by uh, letting them listening to how the virus is entering through the food into their body and to create the sensation of viruses in contact with the human body. And the next one, which we also did it uh, back in June uh, when during the quarantine, that the food are delivered through food delivery at home and I perform through the internet so they can experience how the viruses interact with their body uh, while there's viruses outside, and that was done in Taiwan. So this is pretty much uh, the project. I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you so much, Peying and Miranda, for that. Um, and to all of you, a really fascinating uh, insights into the project with a lot of detail there. So, uh, absolutely wonderful to see the variety of thought that's gone into that and also how their the lines of thought have fed into what we see as the sort of final outcomes on the uh, on the starts project website um, so uh, I'll, I'll just briefly say that our, our project here at Wolverhampton as part of the starts methodologies team is focusing on those different methods of working, the different ways of working that collaborat uh, collaborators from different backgrounds um, use in order to successfully pull off a project um, and how their different backgrounds uh, impact upon the, the pathways and the processes that are taken. So if we come back to Julia and Tommaso to, to talk about Future Flora and, and Alma, I'll sort of group those two together. Um, but I, I know, Tomasa, you've been more involved in, in Ulma, I think that's right. Um, so I'll, I'll just start with this, a broader question, because one of the things that we found in our research, collaborators often put a lot of significance on the importance of meeting on a different plane together or inhabiting something like a third space, a space that's separate to the disciplines that people bring to the table. So there is a kind of a new third space created when you work together. Is that something that you found 
um, when working together? I will say so, yes, because actually, um, as you can imagine, it was not, um, well, actually, we, we kind of align um, like organically, but yeah, at the beginning, it was really an effort between like both of us to get closer with the language. So we really like worked on uh, creating a bridge to really merge the scientific language with the design artistic language and try to see how we can both speak to each other. So I was reading more scientific paper while Tommaso was like more also like getting into the speculative design and, and the, the biohacking, even though like it's really far from what it, it could do in the lab. And uh, I would say that now, like without this actually bridge that we created, we wouldn't be able to really like uh, this and go in depth so much with Alma. And the, in the team now, it's really like with medical anthropologists, physicists, material scientists, biotechnologists, fashion designer, like we really open up because uh, it's essential. So it's really essential to be an interdisciplinary group. Yeah. Yes, uh, go ahead, Marcel, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with Julia in terms of like, uh, yes, we have to create a new sort of like field in terms of like where we sit, as you said, like want to join the to kind of create a, a third layer. But um, I think it's like not as far from where each of us come from as uh, you might think, because like we are comfortable with the with our expertise but then obviously as Julia said we need to shift our mindset and our language to sort of be able to approach um, different different people and uh, also to sort of like make them feel comfortable with uh, with the topics and the and the language that we use so just to explore this notion of a bridge what are we talking about there are we talking about a shared uh, language or sort of set of terms are we talking about um a, a sort of framework of seeing or knowing that you can both share uh, definitely language and then also methodology in working so of course like um design and, and science has different time in work like but really like timetable but also time in space and uh, and we, we kind of had line recently because of course, while sometimes like the science took more time to, to, to really like explore and validate. Meanwhile, I was joining in with uh, um, like different methodologies now to explore, for example, the user. So I was more, if Tommaso was more technical, I was trying to be more social and from an anthropological level to, to, to merge the technology. And uh, but then we meet in the lab, which is also very nice. So we meet in the lab with uh, prototyping and with actually merging technology, science and fashion together, which is uh, the most exciting part, I will say now, especially when you are in the field of uh, like wearable technology, biotechnology for the, the healthcare. Uh, it's where now like uh, you can create more interesting exploration, I would say. I think the other, the other sort of like from a practical point of view, it's sort of like understanding each other's mental framework in the way you do a project. So the way I'm a scientist, I still see the goal of the project, that's what we're trying to do and then kind of break it down in different ways. And I generally try to keep it as linear as possible because that's the fastest way you can probably, you can do something. But then in a design world, this is not necessarily the case because we might not do, not the ending, but the more interesting part is the question and the question might take us in a spiral way or like from point b to f to d to n randomly and so it's something that it took us time to understand that neither of these approaches is wrong but we need to sort of understand where our vision where we want to go and then like we kind of merge our paths in a way that is uh, efficient enough to reach our goal but sort of like um, creative enough or like I say open to allow us to actually reach a different goal that we didn't even know existed at the beginning. And, and this idea of moving from point B to F, moving in a, in a way that you can't predict, uh, underlying that, there has to be quite a strong sense of trust between you that, 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 that 
moving in a, in a direction that might not seem clear or obvious at the beginning is going to lead somewhere. Yes, it, it's essential. I, I will say like, it's also my first and only, no, it's not the only one now, but it's the first also work relationship I had in Italian language with Tommaso, even though most of the time we speak in English by being also both Italian, but both ex, uh, expat. And um, um, yeah, another interesting part is that of course, like as a designer, I tend to be very speculative and creative and really like push it very far with vision. And Tommaso as a scientist, much more based in, in statistics and numbers. So it's, it's very funny that most of the time, like I completely say something very far away and then Tommaso is bringing me back to the present. Actually, you know, this is what, this is, what is based now in, in research. So let's first do this and then we move on. But, but it's the perfect balance because then we don't get bored and we really like move on to, to explore something that yet probably doesn't exist or is not very well developed yet. Yeah, and I mean, we've been working together for over two years. So it's something to say, trust is extremely important and it's not something that we build in like in a month. This like has been a process and it's sort of like, we definitely had like miscommunication. We definitely see like different, uh, like kind of, uh, sort of like misunderstandings and sort of like problems, but then like, it's sort of like, we really took it down to understand like our values and our vision and what we really feel like it's important um, from, from a project level, more from like a human level of what we, we think is important. And I think sort of having this sort of like um, deep connection from like a value standpoint and like a vision standpoint really like make us overlook or overcome easily this sort of like more practical point of view of, uh, from like a bit of language or maybe like some some other sort of turn in the design or the creative process. And, and that's not something, as you say, that you can generate over a few weeks. That has to come from a much longer time span. Um, Julia, I just want to uh, comment on you saying, you know, you, you'd come up with the ideas and then Tomasa would sort of pull you back and ground you to reality. And we've, we, in our research, that's, that's something that has come up previously as well elsewhere. But I just want to refer to something you said earlier, Julia, which was um, actually Tommaso would kind of op open yourself up a little bit more to speculative design. Now, Tommaso, do you feel that working with Julia has impacted uh, in any way on, on, on the ways you think about the application of your work or where it can lead? Yes, I think one of the more interesting points, it's sort of like, understanding the value of something that you can't really put a number to so like an example is you can't put a number to pain that's sort of like what we don't really know about. like it's other sort of like or discomfort or um social stigma like i can't quantify it on a scale and but it doesn't mean there is not value in something like this that's why like in when the speculative work often doesn't really have a tangible results that I can see or measure and sort of like easily sort of like comprehend and quantify and say, okay, speculative design one was better than speculative design two. But, um, but I understand after like working with Julia for so long that actually there is a lot of value in this and it's something that has a more say intimate and personal meaning for each person that interacts with this design or with this piece of art. And uh, I've really come to appreciate the importance and the value of this. Interesting. Um, I want to just ask, ask a question about um, uh, different languages that you might use in, in different situations, because you've talked about the bridge that you've formed so that to allow you to kind of work together um, as a team, but I wonder when you're talking to colleagues in your own disciplines or backgrounds, so Julia, we're talking about the broader art and um, design world and Tommaso more into sort of the, uh, the electronics, the tech uh, world. Do you think you're talking about the project differently to each other? Are you aware of that? Or do you think because of having built this bridge, do you think you're using the same kinds of 
terms, framing it in the same way? I think what I noticed also in a recent talk where, where me and Tomas are together, it's, it's funny that we both say the same things, but yes, with different language and terminology, because Tomaso will say it in a more scientific and deep grounded level, medical also, because we are now really like going into deeper research on, uh, on female intimate health and how we can tackle many other issues. And I will be much more from an emotional level. So, so as a female, I can relate to the topic and I go much more into like understanding how like, like really female can feel, for example, during vaginal infection and how technology can allow to, to feel us empowered and actually to take care of, of ourselves rather than just uh, go to the doctor and everybody every time don't know uh, why actually I, I need to take, for example, specific medicine. So you can see it really like in, uh, in the terminology, but at the same time, what, what I always say is that either you talk with me or, to, or Tomazo because we share the same values, what he said before, it's, it's gonna be the same. So I completely trust him that, um, and I think he does with me, that whatever, like whoever we meet, we know what we want from the person or in that specific context, because yeah, we, we share the same value and space. I think for me, the difference when I speak to others about the project, so let's say other fellow scientists, there is a clear distinction between females and males. I, I, don't, I explain the technical part the same way and both of them understand, but the value that, or, or what is the technology going for has to be explained in a totally different way. Like with males, I have to explain the 75% of women experience infections and 80% of them get like a recurrent infection with females I don't like they understand that there is a problem and that's one of the things that sort of like makes me understand a bit more about like the speculative part where men like like men go uh like uh, go up across life often like really not understanding that females experience like totally different side of problems that they have but they don't talk about, not because they, they don't feel any pain, but it's just because it's not almost allowed for them. Or it's very, there is like the social stigma that it doesn't really allow to communicate for that. Whereas if, uh, if men were, like, were, were experiencing the same pain, there would be a much more open communication, I would say. Um, so that's kind of like the difference where I, where I have to explain the project to uh, my colleagues. Mm. Thank you, thank you. I, and, and it seems like that's a, uh, another aspect to the project, a greater kind of public understanding or awareness, um, which is something that I think we might return to later in a general discussion. Okay, thank you so much, both of you. I'm going to hand you over to Martin um, to discuss with Norma and Christian about Library of Ourselves. Thank you, Richard. And um, yeah, so uh, Norma and uh, Christian, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And um, yeah, we, we've just heard from Julia and Tommaso about their, about the, their project, you know, and, um, but your, your collective um, represents, represents a, different, a different sort of approach to sort of, um, instead of looking at the individual, it's, it's about in, in embodying something, in, embodying the whole thing in, in, in a slightly different way. So, so um, we've talked about this notional sort of uh, concept of this third space in which, in which everybody sort of collaborates, you know, and, and we have seen in our research how how people sort of move in and out of this this collaborative space. So, how do you think how do you think the way that you collaborate um, as in your collective differs from from the previous projects? Maybe there's uh, two things I, I want to say. Like as a collective, um, so the collaboration we have in the collective, it's really yes, we we have very different backgrounds, so mm. we all have different nationalities as well. Um, speak different languages, um, mm -hmm. uh, different professional backgrounds. And so I don't, we have like developed something I think that, that is more keen to uh, code switching. Uh -huh. So um, it's really, I, th through my work with Be Another Lab, I have learned a neuroscientific um, vocabulary that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And now I'm able to talk to other neuroscientists, uh, also outside of um, my work with Be Another Lab. Mm -hmm. um, 
and at the same time I've also like as an anthropologist I mean I also needed to learn like an artistic vocabulary for example mm -hmm. so that is an ability I um like still learning you know but mm. something that that I gained through my work with Be Another Lab and I think the others um like I, I just talked about this with with Marte another member of the collective about this yesterday um because he started out with Be Another Lab as an artist and now he's um close to finishing his PhD in psychology so um doing very um like yeah experimental science really in the lab mm -hmm. so um but there's not so much i think and i don't know if this is a failure of our work or if this is something that we still need to develop um or if it's just like i mean it's important to acknowledge it which is that uh it's not so much a collective practice so we are not so much um we, we don't have a dictionary you know that we sit together and it's like okay oh. let's talk artistic in an artistic mm. manner okay okay now let's talk scientifically i, I wouldn't even know how you yeah. do that yeah so that is one thing and then the other thing so i guess we are a third space in that regard but then um the second thing is that in the installation we have in the machine to be another where two people are swapping perspectives mm. embodied perspectives um they also very often describe it as a third space so mm they can't say where their own body starts and the other begins or I, like this is also the thing like you and i the linguistic reference kind of lose their their meaning because mm. people often say oh when i lifted my arm i mean you lifted your arm and then like who's you who's i when we are in this body swapping together mm. um, so it's interesting yeah. how the artistic practice really determines or shapes the organization of the laboratory itself yeah sure and, and actually it's really interesting that you say, I mean, we, we're talking about a third space as this sort of, this imaginary place, but actually you, you're making it a, a real space where, where people are experiencing something else. So what do you think, Christian? Yeah, I think it's, definitely, it's not so much a third space as, as an in-between space, um, between different things. And there's where it's ambiguous and where there's misunderstandings, there's tensions, and there's... Uh, we, we, we uh, your sound a little bit there, Christian. We, we, if, you, oh, if, you, if, you, if you can, that's it, that's it, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, um, yeah, I agree. I think it's not so much a third space, as uh, Norm was saying, it's, it's a, rather an in-between space. And I think mm. there, there's a lot of ambiguity, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of um, uh, different uh, uh, baggage that people come with, that we all come with, that um, or power structures that exist in, the, in these in these structures, but I think it's a very productive space to be working in. Um, and as Norma said, there's not really, let's say, a, a synthesis that we've achieved of how to do this uh, as a collective. Um, since the project is also very modular, and not only do we have different backgrounds, but we end up executing different aspects of the projects in different contexts. So our learnings that we develop and trying to share them internally with the team is also uh, this collaborative process, which is also fraught with ambiguity and tensions of its own. Um, so, but I think it's just, it's part of it. Somehow we've managed to continue the project and keep on expanding uh, for all these years and it's, it's still going ahead and I think it gives us all a lot of energy. And the lack of uh, concreteness, let's say, or a synthesis or arriving at a certain point is, is at least for me, like a, a, a motivating aspect of this project. Like there's always stuff to learn. There's always um, a, a degree of uh, humility in how you have to approach this and listening and learning um, from each context that you are able to share. And it, and it almost seems like, um, you know, that almost um, from what you're suggesting that the, the team almost sort of sort of mirrors the project itself, you know, and it's really, um, it's, a, it's, it's really interesting to, to hear how, you know, um, you know, artists and, and, and anthropologists and things that are, are collaborating to, to create this fantastic thing that you've made. So what, what I'm really interested in this sort of boundary crossing, this, 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 these objects that, that you have to, the way that you collaborate, you know, you know, how, you know, say, coming back to, uh, um, coming back to Norma, you know, you're an anthropologist, you know, and a scientist, and you've, you've crossed over into the world uh, of, of the arts and humanities almost. And how have you, how have you negotiated that? I mean, is that, you know, what, how have, how have you managed? You know, that, that, that's a really interesting thing, I think. Yeah, it's, um, just by uh, try and error really i mean it it really this is um it becomes its own prototyping process you know mm. like uh the way we um 
the develop the, the machine to be another, the way we develop the laboratory mm. uh, around it. Like it, it is this prototyping process that also, um, yeah, working out uh, what goes well, what, what feels right and what doesn't. And mm. then very often we also, because we are based in different countries, mm. we um, have to do the consolidatory work in place. So say at an event, you know, often also high pressure events. So um, then it is coming together. How do we do this and we improvise? And in that what I had imagined, like when I became a member of the team is that, okay, we sit together and we discuss, you know, what does it mean? Like I'm an anthropologist. I have uh, obligations to uh, my graduate program, certain criteria of knowledge production um, that I have to maintain. And that just didn't happen, you know, like that just didn't happen. Uh, there was no, like, we don't have time for this. We have to, you know, do this and that and the other. And um, it became like a sustained long-term conversation that I, just by the pa time passing by, I learned how to position myself, really. And I'm still, you know, it's still all moving around, really. Yeah. yeah. Not so much. Yeah. And, yeah. And I can see that. I mean, the, the way like I'm a scientist, I'm a microbiologist. So like, you know, the way I negotiate, uh, even with our, with our own team, you know, changes, change, changes daily. Okay. So thank you. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pass you back over to Richard now. Um, so we can, uh, we can have some insights into virophilia. Thanks, Martin. Okay. So uh, I'm actually going to direct a question initially to Miranda um, about the project because to me, the um, a project such as virophilia, I suppose I'm focusing on the, you know, the, the latter part of the, the presentation that you gave, although it was really excellent to see all the thought that, that fed into it from previous projects. Um, but to me, it highlights the, the importance of different ways of knowing, of uh, whether one learns about uh, the aspects of a virus through reading or through watching a documentary or feeling the virus inside the mouth or the esophagus as happens through the, the cooking performances that Pei Ying uh, gives. I'm just wondering what impact this project has had, if any, on, on the ways that you see perhaps public understanding about the virus and uh, about viruses um, and different ways of explaining or experiencing um, the the virus and the related conditions from them um i think the so this is really work from uh pay uh because i was more involved in the tame to is to tame project um but what i see is that it's such a uh, beautiful way to better understand viruses of course i'm in the lab with viruses uh all day so I have certain ideas about them and how you behave around viruses. Um, but that's not the case for everyone. For most people, it's something that you are afraid of. And maybe you, I can tell you a little bit about the technical background. Um, but I think through her work, um, Pai makes them more visible, as you say, um, more understandable. And of course, the current situation with the, the SARS, it's also... Uh, people are so much more aware about the viruses around them and how they behave. Um, it's maybe not uh, the food aspect, but in Tame to Tame, uh, Pei developed a dance with how you connect or uh, behave around the virus. And currently, if I'm in the supermarkets, uh, I always have the feeling that I do uh, the similar dance. It really uh, sort of gets back again I, i'm not sure if more people have that but yeah it's a, a different way of behaving yes i definitely do the covid dance every day i think in various ways um especially because in this country we're very good at queuing so there's a very specific kind of covid queuing that has emerged um paying if i can turn to you and, and sort of I, I guess just go along the same lines of that question um, in terms of the, the public understanding of the vir uh, of viruses um, and obviously um, in relation to COVID-19 as well, we've seen um, at various, various levels of different understandings of the virus through different uh, groups of the public. So I just wonder if you feel there is a greater urgency for projects such as yours, for people to 
not just read about, but actually experience aspects of, of the virus in the ways that you're doing um, through the cookbook, particularly? Well, I think definitely, and especially, well, before, before COVID-19, well, my experience with the audience of my project, uh, a lot of them were coming without knowing what viruses and they are always confusing uh, between viruses and bacteria. So by then my project sort of always have an aspect of educating people what are viruses. But after COVID-19, uh, it changed completely that people seem to have a lot of fear with viruses. And while then it's nice in a way for me in the project that I'm not seeing viruses in a way that is directly related with sickness. And in that sense, I think it's also better because there are like a lot of viruses in this world. And one of the key points where I started virophilia is that one of the virologists I visited, he mentioned that about 90% of viruses are beneficial for their host. And that's something that we miss all the time. So right now the whole world is a bit distressed by the virus and one single virus that make us sick. But then to be fair or to be practical, to consider our relationship with viruses that we need to think about the others that are beneficial for their hosts or they're not related with us, but then maybe related with other species. And I think for that, then we can have a better understanding of the world simply. It doesn't, like we don't really have to implement it in a certain way, but we need different light towards these things. And I think that will also help emotionally for people who are really having a hard time facing this pandemic. And I think that's also what art can do because in art, we have the freedom to imagine and we have the freedom to experience things in different ways. We also have the freedom to experience things just with speculation and not really uh, physical encountering them. So that's why I find very crucial for other people to join and to create different images uh, about viruses. And uh, thank you for that. And just, just to briefly follow up, um, we've talked to before about this idea of the third space and you're saying that coming from the arts, you can, um, you have a greater freedom to imagine um, and to experience. Now, is that, when you when you worked with Miranda, and I think there were a few other scientists as well involved, um, did you find that you were operating on that kind of a third space? Um, did that appear? So as a, separate to your own disciplines, did you find yourself uh, yourself forging an area uh, where you uh, perhaps developed a, a different kind of language or way of operating, or, or did you feel that, that didn't particularly happen? I guess in my case, um, it sort of has, but then also because I had a biological background. So my language, uh, when I'm facing scientists, I'm already uh, putting myself like halfway. Like I was definitely communicating in a different language with people who are from art or who are visiting the exhibition. Um, but I guess also on Miranda's side, uh, I guess by time we gain a bit of trust to each other and then we know when we can sort of go free on our imaginations and just to speculate strange questions. Like, for example, I was asking Miranda the other time, like, where can I go hunt for viruses that I can get most varieties, which you don't really like bump into a virologist and then you ask that question because she knows that what I mean and what I'm gonna do with it. So I'm not gonna mess around like media and trying to make it sound horrible, but rather to make it more friendly. So I guess we do have that third space, which is built on trust. Um, and then the language itself does morph a bit, but maybe Miranda has something even more because I think I have a bit of mixed background. So. Yeah, 
I think for me it was really uh, because the way we started was that you came with me in the lab and uh, I tried to give my um, uh, scientific explanation and you observed and told what you observed, which was, uh, I think, on a different level, uh, more as an artist. Um, and I think the space where we found each other is like my research has much more boundaries because I have the ethical concerns. Uh, my conclusions has to be supported by the data. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to find what is true uh, and I have to express what the caveats are. And um, art is with less boundaries. Um, and for me, that was really uh, something I had to grow into that not everything has to be precise and correct, but there's also space for um, pondering what could happen. I also want to add one thing like uh, Miranda mentioned the ethics and for me the ethics is also important in the sense that uh, I think a lot of time I spend quite a while to trying to listen to Miranda and what are the ethical concerns and how can I transform it into the art space because we are dealing with something that can cause people life so uh, if we want to be free in the art, it's still important that to know what are the dangers and to consider it before it's being implemented. And that's, I think, another thing that sort of doesn't go directly around the project, but it always comes even before the project is in a form. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think, I think we'll leave direct to questions there. Thanks, Peying and Miranda. Now, I think Martin and I have asked enough questions for now, so we've got a very brief amount of time. If anyone else wants to uh, pose a question or a prompt to anyone else, Norma's hand was raised. Go ahead, Norma. Yeah, cheers. Now, I was wondering, um, with Alma, I was wondering, um, the way I understood it, it's basically uh, you, you put a sensor in panties. Um, so, I was wondering, like in terms of like uh, the ethics of knowledge production, right? Like, um, like what what are your thoughts about like how you deal with the data and what you will use with the data? You know, like kind of um, what 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 happens below or um, beyond the user's immediate um, perception in that regard. And then the second thing I was wondering is also, um, do you have a concrete like framework for your project? Would you say like, okay, this is this is product design, for example, this is product development, and it just um, like is maybe a more like democratic form of product development, like you're outside of, you're, you're not part of like a, a great company or something. Or would you frame it more as like, um, like an art project and a speculative design project? Okay, uh, Tommy, I start and then you, you go with the data maybe. I go with the second question. <laughs> um, so uh, Alma came really as a response from um, like, I felt, I feel very close to Pei because I was working as well with bacteria with Future Flora. And uh, somehow as well, my relationship was very kind of symbiosis. So I was really growing them in my room and taking care of them beside how much I also knew that I had to be careful because of course, not having a, a scientific background, I didn't really know what was, was growing on, but I really felt that it was like a, a living relationship with a, a living organism. And, um, and so when I did Future Flora, it, like, uh, it, it was really like, I, I tried to like show that it can be real, but as it, as it was perceived immediately, it was really like, okay, it can never happen. And why as a female, I should put bacteria in my underwear? Like it doesn't make sense. It's, it should be wrong. Like we should, like bacteria, we should swipe them out. Like we always have this perception that bacteria are bad, and especially now with this time of virus. Like it's very difficult to understand what is, what is the boundary, even though when you think that actually we are made also in our skin microbiome of bacteria, then you come back and think, oh, actually, this is why I have to keep always my flora in balance in, and, uh, and I need to actually think also in this different level. And Future Flora had the problem that it was addressed for a future where we are aware of this bacteria environment, and, but we are in a peaceful symbiosis as 
we, are, we usually are with the body and uh, that we will have one day also an incubator at home to grow bacteria. So why not for female to grow our own healthy vaginal flora? But of course, doesn't it exist this, this uh, reality now, but exists the vaginal infection. So I had many, many females like writing me on by email, like, can I be your beta test where I can buy the kit? I really need it, like it, it's essential. And so as a, as a designer and as a, as, a, as a female, I really like felt the need like, to really try to produce something closer to, to this reality. And since I'm specialized in electronic textiles and actually Thomas as well is developing, uh, is finishing actually a PhD on as well, like material, from a material science point of view to like wearable technology, we felt why not that we really try to make a product that can actually respond to this and can give a tool to female to, to take care of their own body. And uh, so we are trying to move out from uh, the speculative because actually we're like, um, the, our topic is very real. So it, ethically, I, I need to be also like, give something now, even though as a, as a designer, I could play speculative forever and I would love it because it's very easy for me um, so somehow we are moving towards a product, towards like the market. But yeah, as you can also argue, we are very, we are playing also very artistically, because I want to keep this part. Because uh, by playing artistically, you can allow the female to accept more technology in the underwear as well. You can really like create a language and a scenario that will let them understand easier that actually technology is not always scary and it can be implemented even in an intimate area like the, like the vulva. So somehow we are like really like jumping from the scientific to the artistic to the actual like market and, and, and product vision to really understand how quicker or not we will arrive probably to have a product. Okay. Um, uh, uh, all right, Thomas, uh, yes, go yeah, ahead. It, we, we very uh, briefly, if we can. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Norma, that's a very good question about the data privacy. We sort of like spoke a lot internally and tried to speak with others as well. And um, we basically understand actually what the user needs and what the doctor's needs might be different. We do not want to collect data for the sake of collecting data to create a massive database, kind of like Google style, and then I don't know what we'll do with it. We want to collect data only when it's needed, but we don't believe that the, all the responsibility of choosing where the data goes can just be a first screen of the app saying, do you want to send your data to the community, to the doctor? No. There is much, it's much more difficult than that. And just simply like, we want to give the user the opportunity to choose, but we need to be an informed choice. There needs to be um, something where we really explain them where this data goes, what does the what doctor really want to know, what does the researcher need to know. So it's something that we take very seriously. Uh, we don't have like a, a one answer for all this, but we want to work with the users and the doctors to really only collect the data that is necessary, not any more than that. Okay, thank you so much, Julia and Tommaso, for answering and to Norma for that question. I'm so sorry, we'll have to finish there for time. I'm afraid we're, we're quite limited by the time that we've got. So uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for your presentations and then the, the ensuing discussion. It's absolutely fascinating to hear the, um, the variety of perspectives and, and ways of working that people have developed here and, and how they're continually changing as well. So thank you again for your uh, participation and There'll now be a live Q&A session with members of the Starts Methodologies team from the University of Wolverhampton. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cut. Cut. It's a wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap, folks. <laughs> Everybody relax. <laughs> That's it. It's in the can. <laughs> That was such a shame that we couldn't carry on. Seriously. Yeah, that was fun. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I was really enjoying that. It was fabulous. And it's, it's nice to see, um, it's nice to have that mix of like, you know, as a, as a scientist that's coming to the world of arts as part of this project, you know, I, I, I've, I've developed the same things. I've 
you know, it's, it's nice to hear the hear like the, what other people's experiences, you know, um, because I've I've done exactly the same things to to be able to cope as well, you know. So um, so it's it's fab. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been it's been absolutely fascinating. As it has thank you so much for uh, taking the time to put the presentations together and, mm. and such i feel like we could have carried on talking for yeah. Yeah. hours, hours. <laughs> hours. Yeah. yeah okay claire what's what's next right well um we can wrap up whenever you're ready um the minute we stop recording we'll all disappear so um when when you're ready to finish, um, just say and we'll we'll hit the the stop button and then we'll all go. Okay. Well, like oh, what a shame! I feel like it was just going. I was really um, enjoying that. Just <laughs> with another hour, because oh. um, it was just really. It would have been really nice to have heard, heard a little bit more cross pollination of people yeah. talking, but yeah. uh, you know we were we've been restricted with the amount of time we've been allowed. Uh, we've obviously gone over and we're going to have to cut um, a few odd little bits, but hopefully the, the body of it will stay. And who knows, maybe we get another chance um, yes. in other places, maybe next year. I was mm. also thinking of Isaiah is in uh, Barcelona, if it happens. Yeah. You know, um, it would be great if it does happen. It'd be great to get another round table together. But hopefully we'll be able to uh, pursue I have this a question. A Hi, Julia. Yeah. Hi, Denise. Thank you for for putting all of this and us also together because I I, I felt that like the three of of us in terms of project and and people like we were really like like in in a good flow and uh, and, yeah. and coordinating and, and very I don't know mapping each other. I could see many things. And as a question, like, are we also all the three projects exhibit in the same space? Um, no, not be another lab, okay. but uh, Virophilia and yourself. And then there's another project, which is This Is Grown uh, okay. from last year. So mm. it's actually, it's a kind of combination. It's the project exhibition. So it's very quite a lot of text there. Uh, you'll see in the introduction and we'll also put other things online as well. And then we wanted to kind of bring, bring it alive with some of the projects that we could bring into that space. Uh, you'll see that, you know, uh, pay, uh, pays, uh, scroll is amazing in that space. It's really great, you know? Uh, yeah. So that's as much as we could do. Um, but there's information okay. about Be Another Lab and yes, a few of the other projects yeah. in, in the exhibition yeah. that just don't have a... Um, a no. uh, obviously, we planned the, um, to have the conference and Be Another Lab were going to do a major part there mm. and we've had to, we obviously had to cancel that. Unfortunately, our project finances ended at the end of uh, July. Mm. So I'm going to try and negotiate with the university to you know give us a bit more money but it's a bit tricky in the covid crisis at the moment uh, because the universities are very nervous financially uh, but we'll try and see because i'd love to do a conference here at the university and kind of follow really follow it through and i also without you know speculating too much i'd really like to take the exhibition elsewhere because we always imagined that we would try and uh, uh, sort of tour the exhibition uh -huh. in the UK to mm. really try and promote the idea of the starts project. So, uh, but we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll have to see. But thanks for that. <laughs> so, is I'm that? Yeah. Can, can, I, can I just ask one question, right? Just just before we go, it's a bit frivolous, yeah. really, right? Yeah. But I've got to know, Miranda and Pei Ying, right? What's your favourite virus? <laughs> like, like I've, I've got to ask. What's your favourite one? Norovirus. norovirus by far, yeah. Oh, norovirus yeah. all the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Norovirus. Got to be nor eleven. Eleven particles can infect a person. Yeah. Let's, let's face it. You know, so it's got to be a good one, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm not terribly fond of the new coronavirus. <laughs> no, no, nor am I. Nor am I. I, I. I must admit. I must admit. I'd rather have SARS than this one. 
And on that note. On that note, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Cheers everyone, bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Uh, Denise, great to see you. Yeah, Good take day. care Christian, bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye.